All right, good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday, fun day. It's good to be in the house of God with you. Well, we're in a series, and today is the grand finale of that series. We're in a series called Signposts, and these signs all point to Jesus. So we've been looking at the exhilarating book of Leviticus. I know you're so excited about that, but it is, Leviticus 23 is where all the seven Hebrew feasts are listed and mentioned. So somebody asked me, why are you teaching on this? Well, because it's, it's in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, we should know what's in there. But we should know what the significance or the meaning of these feasts are and how they relate to our life. This is something that, I mean, thousands of years ago, God put this in the Scripture but all, he put these in the scripture in advance to point to something that's coming. And how many know that something was a someone and his name is Jesus? So we talked about the spring feasts that were all fulfilled in the Jewish month of Nisan. Then we have the three fall feasts that they are, they're partially fulfilled, but they're going to be fulfilled. They're prophetic in the sense that the, the spring feasts have already been fulfilled in Christ. The fall feasts are going to be fulfilled in the last days, which is what we're entering into. There's all sorts of signs pointing to the fact that we're in the last days. You know, foxes appearing on the, the Temple Mound, uh, 172 different species of predatory birds migrated to the Holy Land recently. So we say, wow, well, they're getting ready for dinner. I mean, so that, I know that's kind of gross, but <clears throat> that they're going to be cleaning up after the, uh, the, the Battle of Armageddon. And there's no sign for the rapture, but there are lots of signs for the second coming of Jesus. So we can see those signs coming, and then we just back up about seven years and know the rapture is close. So two weeks ago, we talked about the Feast of Trumpets. That was exciting. Last week, we talked about the Day of Atonement, which was kind of a, it was more of a, it wasn't a, fa a feast, it was a fast. So it was kind of a bleak, somber, sober day. But the feast that comes after that one is the last one. It's the seventh one. Now, if you're thinking, you said three feasts in the spring and three feasts in the fall. It's only six feasts. Well, there's one in the middle. And it's not in the month of Nisan. It's not in the month of Tishri where the fall feasts are. It's in the summer months. And that is, a, is the Feast of Pentecost. And that represents the church age that we're in right now. But we're getting to the end of that age. And we're about to start entering into the fall prophetically speaking, which is when we start to see the fulfillment of these other feasts. So let's get into it. Leviticus 23 is kind of God's uh, year at a glance calendar. So he could just see the whole year in Levit Leviticus 23 because all seven of the feasts are mentioned there. And, uh, and, but we talked about this, and if you don't remember, I'll remind you that the word feast is actually in the, word, in, in the Hebrew language is the word moed, <clears throat> which means a signal. Or, or it means a sign pointing to something, but it also means a target. How many know God has targets on his calendar? And how many know God always hits the bullseye? Amen. We said that on, the, on Passover, Jesus fulfilled Passover to the, not to the day, but to the minute. Amazing. As they were slaughtering the Passover lamb, they were nailing Jesus to the cross. Amazing. So uh, if he did it to the minute, with the spring feast, he will fulfill them precisely in the fall feast that are yet to come. The first one's the catching away of the church trumpets. Then we see the day of atonement, which is the national uh, or the nation of Israel repenting and acknowledging their Messiah. We believe that will happen sometimes during Jacob's trouble or what we call the tribulation. And then the day of uh, uh, the, the feast of tabernacles, which we're discussing today, is it's a party and it's a seven day party. So. And we're going to talk about why it's so exciting. But the word feast also means appointment, and it also means dress rehearsal. So all the feasts are just dress rehearsals for the actual fulfillment. Again, the spring feasts have been fulfilled during the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection. Uh, Pentecost was fulfilled to the minute, to the day, on the Feast of Pentecost when God poured his spirit out on the church. And so now we're going to talk about uh, lucky number seven. So here comes the, the grand finale of the Feast of Tabernacles. So um, let's talk about it. 
It's also called the Feast of Booths. They would build these little temporary booths and they would camp in them for seven days during this feast. I'm going to tell you why. It was observed in the fall from the 15th to the 22nd of the month of Tishri, which for us on our solar calendar is September, October. And this was known, it became known as the season of our joy. So this was such a happy time that it was known as the season of joy. So if we were to say, hey, Turkey Day's coming, you'd know we're talking about Thanksgiving, right? Or we'd say, hey, you know, uh, old St. Nick is on his way. Well, we're talking about Christmas. Well, the season of joy, they knew, well, that means the Feast of Tabernacles. So like I said, this was a seven-day party. And what they did was families would construct these small, hastily built little huts and they would live in these huts for seven days, and they would have delicious food and these meals, and they would eat. So it'd be kind of like, uh, and this is what they do in Israel, they would go, you'd, like you'd go out in your backyard, and you'd pitch a tent, or you'd build uh, uh, some curtains, you'd put some curtains up in a, in a box, and then you would put some palm branches on top for like a thatched roof, and you would hang out in that for seven days. I don't know if that doesn't sound like fun to me, but I'm more of a glamper, not a camper, but, uh, but this is what they do. They still do it to this day. Now, in modern times, they also, I hear many of them mount their flat screen TVs out in the tent, but I don't think that's what they did in the wilderness back in the day. But what are they doing? They're remembering when they walked for 40 years through the wilderness, and they're remembering how they dwelt in these temporary dwellings in the uh, land of sojourning while they were on their way to their promised land. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like us living this life on our way to heaven. This is not our permanent home. We're on our way to a permanent promised land. Isn't that right? And on our way there, we live in a tent, which is our body. <laughs> but the Bible says we're going to be getting a house. It calls it a building. So in other words, we're going to go from a hut to a house. So what you live in now is a hut. I'm not talking about your apartment or your home. I'm talking about your body. Compared to what it's going to be, it's a hut compared to a house. Now, it could be a beautiful hut. I mean, just think of whatever's attractive to you. You know, somebody who's a CrossFit trainer and they've got like 5% body fat, you know, but that is a hut. Or maybe it's job of the hut. Whatever, whatever you like, but it's a hut. And one day we're getting an upgrade. We're going to get a glorified body. Isn't that awesome? So uh, that's what this tabernacle of feast represents. And so they were remembering the temporary homes that they lived in in the desert after Exodus, uh, when they, after the Exodus, when they left Egypt. And they were remembering, now listen to this, God's sheltering provision and care. Can I say that again? They were remembering God's sheltering provision and care as they traveled in the desert with a pillar of cloud by day to guide them and a pillar of fire by night to warm them and to protect them from the wild beasts. So even in the middle of a wilderness experience, they knew that God was taking care of them. So can I just say it this way, that the reason they had thatched roofs is so, because God, when they laid on their back and went to sleep at night, God wanted them to see up and see the stars peeking through and remember that that's where their help came from. So even though we live on this earth, you keep an eye on heaven. So even if you feel like right now you're going through a wilderness, and maybe you are, I want you to remember that even when you're in the wilderness, God takes care of you. Remember that he protected them from the wild beast and he kept the serpents and the snakes out of their tents and he made bread fall down from heaven. And one time he even brought in uh, just pounds and pounds of quail meat for them to eat. And they had meat for days. Even if their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out. In the midst of the wilderness, God provided for them. So if you feel like you're in a wilderness or you're like, man, there's a recession going on. Listen, okay, maybe in the world it's a wilderness, but even in the wilderness, our God takes abundant care of us. Amen. So 
Later, this feast of tabernacles became known as the Feast of Ingathering because once they went over into the Promised Land, they were no longer in temporary homes. They were living in the land, farming the land. And that was the time of year that they gathered in the final harvest of the year. Earlier in the year, they gathered in the grain harvest, Pentecost. But now, in the fall, they gathered in the fruit. So all the fruit trees and the grapes and all the, the, the uh, um, you know, pomegranates and all these things were in the fall. In the summer, grain. In the fall, fruit. So this was the final ingathering. How many know there's a final ingathering coming? Yes. God's going to gather in the final harvest of souls on the earth in the autumn of human history. There's going to be a great ingathering of maybe people that you thought were just fruity, but God's like, no, they're part of my final harvest, man. I'm gathering them into my kingdom. You're going to see infamous sinners get born again. You're going to see people, you're going to think, no, they could never, uh-huh. God's going to be like, I'm going to get Justin Bieber saved, and I'm going to get, just go down the list, right? You might not believe it, but even Kanye is saved, and I'm going to be getting people born again that you would thought, mm, surely they would never. But no, God's going to be bringing notorious people to Jesus in these last days. And not just that, but he's going to be bringing a lot of them. Amen? Because he's a merciful God and he's pulling out all the stops. He's a good God. So this Feast of Tabernacles... It occurs five days after the last feast, the Day of Atonement, which remember that was a real serious, somber, it was a day of repentance. And five days later, five is the number of grace, by the way, there is the beginning of this seven-day celebration. So why is this feast so happy, the Feast of Booths? Well, the Day of Atonement just happened and everybody repented and got right with God. And how many know that when you're right with God, you're going to be happier, there's going to be rejoicing because you're not dealing with guilt and shame and you're not struggling with, you know, your junk because your junk has been dealt with. And so when you're holy, you're happy. Amen. It's called the oil of gladness. And the devil and the world wants you to think, oh, you're missing out. You know, you could be doing all this. You could be partying and you could be, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll and whatever. But when you're holy is when you're happy because you're not dealing with guilt and shame and all those things. And the, and the Bible even says, and I love the Bible because it tells the truth. It says sin is fun for a season. I mean, that season ends. I like to say it this way. Sin is fun for a season. Then there's hell to pay. That's how it really works. But everybody just repented. The whole nation just got right with God. Now there's this seven-day celebration. Uh, and, of course, people are happy when they get right with God. Remember in Acts chapter 8, Philip went down to Samaria. He preached Christ to them. And the Bible says, and, and there was great joy in the city. Why? Because they had turned to Jesus. Great joy. That should exemplify our lives. Great joy. I love that. So they're actually commanded by God to rejoice. Can you imagine? God's you're going to rejoice. You're going to be happy. <laughs> I don't know how he commanded them, but he, they're commanded to rejoice. I think, you know, the Bible commands us to rejoice. And the reason that I think God commands us to rejoice is because, how I many you know, he knows some stuff we don't know. He knows we have good reason to rejoice. And I just want to remind you today, if you forgot, you have good reason to rejoice. Everything's going to be all right. Remember that old song, I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Good old gospel song. Everything's going to be all right. So they rejoice for this seven-day festival because, uh, and during this seven days, they were expected to give charitably to the synagogue because, remember, God loves a what? A cheerful giver. So he's like, if you're happy, you should be given. So it's a time of generosity. So there will be an opportunity for you at the end of the service today to exercise that part of the feast. We're going to receive the offering. So we'll see how happy you are. <laughs> All right, so since tabernacles follows atonement or repentance, it represents restored fellowship 
with the Lord and God dwelling amongst his people. In other words, it's the prophetic. What's going to happen is that Jesus is going to come and set up his kingdom on the earth and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years and we will rule and reign with him. And in other words, I will be your God and you will be my people. Like literally, I'm moving my throne to planet earth. And that's what the Feast of Tabernacles is pointing to. They recreated the hardship of the wilderness dwellings, and this represented, again, their temporary dwellings. And uh, I'm going to just read this verse to you. I just think it's encouraging. It's in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, where Paul said, For we know that if our earthly house or our body, this tent, remember he, he reminded us that we're getting an upgrade. If this tent of our body is destroyed, we have a building from God, like a skyscraper, a house, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. So he's reminding us the hut's going to turn into a house. The tent's going to be a skyscraper. You're getting an upgrade. And let me give you the punchline of the message today. The purpose and point of the Feast of Tabernacles is to remember God's faithfulness to us in the wilderness and to look forward with hope to the messianic age when all nations will come to Jerusalem and they will worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. We will literally see this happen. But in the meantime, again, I'm here to remind you that if you're in a wilderness, rejoice and be glad because even in the wilderness, he promised he'd take care of you. So how I many know we, we have a recession-proof life, amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. So... When we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're thinking about the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Zechariah 14, 16 says, Zechariah 14, 16, now this verse is still in Israel's future, prophetically, it's going to happen. It says, Jews and Gentiles will worship the Messiah together in Jerusalem. So let's review the Feast of Tabernacles. Four things. Remember, it's a, it's, they're remembering their 40 years of wandering in the desert. So number one, they wandered living in temporary huts. Uh, we live in a temporary place. How many know that we are, this, is, this earth is not our home, or this earth as it is is not our home? The Bible says, the Apostle Peter said, we are like aliens passing through. So I don't know if you believe in aliens or not, but you should because we're them. Ha! <laughs> We're passing through. This, this earth is going to get renovated, and we're going to come back and uh, live here and rule and reign with Jesus. But this is a temporary. So whatever it is you're going through, it's temporary. Just remember that. Every, say everything's temporary. It is. Number two is that uh, they, uh, they were brought to their final home or to their promised land or to their ultimate destination. So we live in a temporary place, but we're going somewhere. We're going to an eternal place that's not going to be temporary. It's, it's permanent. And it's going to be awesome. Number three, they celebrated this feast during the harvest season or in the fall. So that means that there's going to be a harvest of people in the autumn of history. There's going to be, we're going to see a great uh, a number of people turning to Jesus. And, and according to some sources, and you can Google this, but according to some sources, the church universally here in the world is growing three times faster than the world's population is growing. That's pretty cool. And it's growing faster than Islam is growing. And so there's a, at one point, I don't know if this is still the case, but at one point there was 30,000 people a day in China coming to Jesus. Now I know politically we got some beef with China, but there's more Christians in China than there is in America, just numerically speaking. Now percentage wise, there's more Christians in America than China, but we got to remember that no matter what happens with China, we got brothers and sisters over there. So we need to pray for them. Uh, about 80,000 people per day globally are coming to Jesus. And atheism is losing about 300 people a day. <laughs> They're getting born again. I mean, you can't be an atheist when you get born again. So, Now, I, I said all that to say that 
the, this final end gathering, I believe, has already, it's trickling, it's begun. But it's going to become a tsunami. We're going to see literally hundreds of millions of people born again. Right now in India, there's a caste of people that represents about 300 million people, Hindus, and they are saying, we don't like this. How come we got to be at the bottom of the totem pole? We want something different. So they are now investigating Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. And because of some of the uh, radical Islamic terrorist things that have happened in the world in, in recent times, they're like, ah, we're not really thinking about that. Well, we've kind of narrowed it down to Buddhism and Christianity. So can you imagine in one day, a third of an, a 300 million people going, hey, we want Jesus. Yes. Just like that. That's incredible. Let it be Lord. So that's what the Feast of Tabernacles is alluding to. That's not, and that's what we're heading towards. And then finally, number four, remember the Feast of Trumpets that happens before this. And that is the last trumpet is going to sound. And I just want to remind you of what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says in verse 16 and 17. It says, uh, it says that the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. So Jesus has a trumpet and he's going to blow that trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, those of us who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. Ever. And then it says, comfort one another with these words. This is a comforting thing. And I can just imagine every day, Jesus, is, he's got his horse saddled. He's like, is today today, Lord? Is Daddy, is today today? Is, I'm ready. You just say the word, I'm ready. How many of you can put your money on that horse? That horse is coming. You can bet on that horse. It's just a matter of time at this point. So we know that seven, six is the number of man. Five is the number of grace. I told you that earlier. Four is the number of new beginnings. And that's... Oh, man, you could go to Genesis 1, verse 14, and read that passage and about lights. And they, the greater light rules the day, the lesser light rules the night. And then he says, he put the sun and the moon in the sky. The sun is Jesus. The moon is the church. The moon reflects the light of the sun. On the fourth day of human history, after 4,000 years after Adam, the church was born. Jesus came, and then the church came. So it was, that happened on the fourth day. And then, anyway, there's just a whole bunch there. I just need to write a book about it because I can't get it all out in these, in these sessions. But I love that the lesser light, the one that's weaker, is the one that rules the dark. In other words, God's like, you don't even need a lot of light to defeat the darkness. So you got everything you need to walk in authority and dominion over the devil. Amen. You're supposed to rule and dominate the darkness. So anyway... Then we see that the seventh day is the, called the Sabbath or the day of the Lord. So six, the first six days, man gets. And then the seventh day, Jesus says, that's my day. So you got 6,000 years of human history. Then the 7,000th year is the millennial reign of Christ. M, if, how many of you are familiar with Roman numerals? You know, you got I and V and X. And, all right. So you got... There's, there's, uh, there's seven symbols, and the seventh one is M, which means a thousand or millennium, but they never used that one. The only person who was authorized to use the M was the emperor. So if they wanted to say a thousand, they had to do two symbols for 500, unless you're the emperor. Well, how many of Jesus is using the M? He's, he's, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And so and I just think it's interesting that there, that there are seven of them, and the seventh one is reserved for the king. So, uh, but the, the number eight, if seven's the number of completion, eight is the, if seven's the day of the Lord, eight's the day of God. Eight's the number of eternity. That's the day that doesn't end. That's the day that goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And so... When the rabbis would finish reading the scripture or when a, a party or a feast was over, they would roll up the scroll to signify, okay, we're done, it, the end. You know that old hymn that says, uh, and in the book of Revelation, it says, God rolled up the heavens like a scroll? Why? Because it's over. It's, we're done. The end. I mean, the end is the end of time, but it's not the end of everything, it's just the end of time as we know it, and it's the beginning of eternity. So the eighth day is the day of God. 
And here's what I love is that the oldest prophecy in human history that we know of was prophesied by one of my favorite Bible characters named Enoch. He's the seventh from Adam. That's important, seven. In other words, Adam was his great, 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 great granddaddy. And they lived 900 years back then. So when Adam was an old man, Enoch was a young man. They were, they were alive at the same time for a little while. And then uh, we know that Enoch means commencement or graduation. And we know that Enoch, the Bible says, Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. Well, how many know that we also are the seventh from Adam? And those of us that walk with God, he's taken us too. We're going to graduate on up out of here. Amen. It's exciting. Like, like that little girl, her, her line, she was an angel and she was in the Easter play and she was supposed to say, he is not here. He is risen. But when the play actually started, she saw the crowd. She got nervous and, and she said, he ain't here. He done left out. <laughs> she still got the point across, but how I many one day they're going to be looking for the church and, and some angel is going to say, he, they ain't here. They done left out. Amen. <laughs> But the oldest prophecy in human history is about the second coming of Jesus, and Enoch gave it. You can read it in the book of Jude. So, but what's interesting about that is that before the flood came, Enoch was taken. The flood represents the tribulation. So here's three types of people that were facing the flood of Noah. Number one, those who actually entered uh, into the ark. That was Noah and his crew. There was eight of them. Remember, eight's number of eternity. So eternal life is in the ark, in Jesus Christ. And then we see those that were, uh, then they were caught up to the heavens. The Bible says that the flood covered the highest peaks. I was just, uh, I was just standing and looking at the third highest peak in the world. It's called Kanchenjunga. It's only 81 feet shorter than K2. It's all, they're all, all three of the highest peaks are in the Himalayas. And, but the Bible says that the waters covered all those peaks. And so that means the water was at least 30-something thousand feet. So the ark was caught up to the heavens. The righteous were caught up. The wicked were wiped away. That's the seven-year tribulation. And then the floods receded. The righteous came back down. The door of the ark opened, and there was a new earth. And Adam, or, or I'll get it right, Noah <laughs> came out and he began to rule and reign in this new earth. Well, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus in the new earth. Well, but what happened before all that was somebody was caught up before the flood. Well, who's that? That's Enoch. So you got those who entered the ark, those that were taken away by the flood, and then you got those that were caught up before the flood. Who's that? Enoch. And he represents the church. Now, here's something just interesting that I just learned, and I think you'll be fascinated by this like I am, is that Jewish tradition says, and Enoch's a very important person in Jew Jewish tradition, but they say that Enoch was born on Shavat, or the Feast of Harvest, or Pentecost. <laughs> Who else was born on Pentecost? The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the same dude that got caught up before the flood was, has the same birthday as us, Pentecost. We were born in the fire of Pentecost, and so was Enoch. And those that were, the church is going to be caught up just like Enoch was caught up. Amen. That's awesome. I just think that's cool because nothing's in there by accident. The Feast of Tabernacles is symbolic of the wedding festival of the Lamb. In other words, Jesus' wedding is going to happen, and who's he getting married to? The church. Now, in Jewish tradition, weddings were seven days long, and they were seven-day celebrations. They were happy times. How many know weddings should be happy? Right now, oh my God, I'm getting married. No, you should be, if that's how you feel, maybe you shouldn't, you should reason consider. But weddings were happy, exciting times. And so remember when in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And, and then you skip to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel. See, that's always been God's goal is to dwell with us. Of course, sin came in and caused the separation. That's why God said, I will become a man. I'll become like them so they can become like me. So the old language or the original language that was written, it says, and the word became flesh 
and, and, and he, instead of dwelt among us, it says he tabernacled with us. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles because God wants to dwell with man, but he had to come dwell with us the first time so he could come dwell with us the second time. In other words, remember, there's going to be signs in the heavens. And 2,000 years ago, about 2,000 years ago, approximately, around uh, 4 B.C.-ish, there was a star in heaven called the Bethlehem Star, which was the Jupiter planet, Jupiter. Jupiter is the biggest planet. It's the king planet. And Venus, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and um, Regulus, like Regal, it means king, they all came together and they formed what we call the Bethlehem Star. And it was in the constellation of Virgo, the virgin, because the king was born of a virgin. And then last year at Christmas, on NBC, or was it NBC Nightly News they, or Dateline or one of those, they said there's a celestial event for the first time in 2,000 years. The star of Bethlehem is back in the heavens. Jupiter, Venus, and Regulus. And, and Regulus, it, look, it was going backwards. It's called retro act, retrograde motion. Or it's really, anyway, but, but it, was going like, it was going like this over Jupiter and Venus. In other words, it was crowning King Jupiter. And guess where it was? It was not in Virgo. This time it was in Leo because the first time he came, he was born of a virgin. The second time he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So the signs in the heavens are even pointing that he's coming soon. Amen. And so the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So what I want to point out to you is in John chapter 7, remember when Jesus, he cried out, the Bible says on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus cried out, if anybody's thirsty, remember that? Let him come to me and think. No, he didn't say that. He said, come to me and drink. How I many of we should do more drinking? Anyway, that's another sermon for another Sunday. <laughs> but <clears throat> what's the last day, the great day of the feast? Well, it would be like if I said, hey, Turkey Day's coming. We know that's Thanksgiving. Well, the Jews knew the last or the great day of the feast. Well, what's that? That's the, the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Because that was the joyous occasion. And so on the last day, the great day of the feasts, of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Sanhedrin, the priests, they were doing their annual parade where they took golden pitchers down to the River Jordan. They would march in a big long line and they would all scoop out water and they would go back to the temple and they would pour out the water on the altar and the water would just begin to pool up and it would begin to flow out under the door of the tabernacle out into the streets. Now, if that's not symbolic. Now, when that was happening... <clears throat> They're getting their water. They're pouring. It's a water pouring ceremony. While that's happening, Jesus, he jumps up and he says, hey. And I just want you to imagine this. He says, hey, he cries out with a loud voice. If anybody's thirsty, and they're like, we got all this water. What do you mean if anybody's thirsty? If anybody's thirsty, now you have to remember, the Jews did this because they were expecting the Messiah to come. Yes. And that's what this feast was about. Heaven and Messiah is coming. And he jumped up and he goes, hey, if anybody's thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And I will give them living water. And out of your belly will flow rivers of, where is the river of water flowing out of? The temple. He's like, I'm gonna, I'll make you the temple. And the Bible says, and this he spake concerning the Holy Ghost. How many know if, you, if you're born again and you got the Holy Ghost, you are now the temple of the living God. And out of your belly flows a river of living water. And so they were like, wait a minute. In other words, Jesus was saying, hey, you come to me and I'll give you, 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 I think, you think you're having fun. You come to me, I'll give you a real reason to celebrate. You just think this party's good. I'll give you, I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost. Ha! <laughs> Woo! That's good stuff. Amen. So I'm going to read some verses to you out of the book of Revelation, which is a happy book, by the way. 
It's not dark. I mean, there's some, some devastating things that happen. Like it talks about wormwood, you know, a flaming mountain that plows into the planet, you know, and takes out a third of the population. Well, you know, NASA just said, hey, oh, by the way, in 2029, there's a giant meteor coming and we think it's going to hit us. <laughs> now, don't freak out because then they've revised their, they go, okay, it's not going to hit us. It's just going to come close to us. It's going to come so close, it's going to take out satellites that are orbiting our Earth. I mean, that's, that's pretty close. And they were saying this thing is a planet killer. You can Google it. It's, it's interesting. And they're even developing Star Wars technology where they, they're trying to aim, and they, they thought, well, let's just blow it up. And they thought, well, then we get a bunch of rocks hitting this. So let's try to see if we can nudge it off of its trajectory. So they're trying to figure out how to do all that, which is, I think is awesome because that means if it's coming, and they said if it doesn't hit us in 2029, then they hope it doesn't. If it passes through this little space called the keyhole, that means when it comes back around seven years later, go figure, seven years, then it'll hit us. So my point is, is whether it hits us or not, we're close. But for us, this is exciting because the king is coming. It, may, it should make it easier to preach the gospel, right? Because this is not stuff that's a secret. It was this big NASA cover-up, but it got, they got exposed. And so now they're, they're like, okay, we got to tell everybody there's an asteroid coming, all right? We're trying to figure it out. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. But my point is, Revelation is a happy book for us. Let me read something to you from it. Revelation 21. I'm going to read you the last two chapters of the last book of the Bible. First one. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And that's good already. Yeah. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no more sea. The sea represents lost people. Um, I mean, there's going to be a day when there are no more lost people. They are all sorted out yeah. one way or the other. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So there's an actual city, a, a heavenly Jerusalem, and it's about 1,500 miles square. I mean, that's a big city. And it's going to come down and plant on planet Earth. And he says, it's coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. I mean, that's the goal. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So if you got any pain today, I hope you don't. You can get healed of it. But if you got pain today, there won't be any more pain of any kind. And then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. I mean, that's what Jesus does. He makes all things new. And he said, right, for these words are true and faithful. And Jesus said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Hallelujah. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. Remember John 7? That's what he's actually going to do it. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, that's people who try to use power from somewhere other than God, yes. from controlled or uncontrolled substances to witchcraft, idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So those folks that don't accept Jesus are going to get a permanent retirement package at the lake. Yeah. Now, if you're thinking, oh, man, one of those words described me. <laughs> Listen, you can repent. You can get born again. Say, but I, I struggle with one of those things. I, I, was, I was born this way. You're right, you were. We were all born that way. What way? Well, whatever it is you struggle with. How many know we all struggle with something? And, and if you don't raise your hand, you're lying. That's what your struggle is. <laughs> so we all, start, you know why? Because we all got one of these. Flesh. It's a body. And if you're born into Adam's family, da -da -da -da, you struggle with something. Now, you might not struggle with what I struggle with, and I might not struggle with what you struggle with, but I knew one thing, we all struggle with something. And whatever it is you struggle with, you were born with it. 
And that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Amen? Amen. So in other words, whatever it is you struggle with, if you're born again, the power of that thing is broken, and then you can live up to your full potential, or Jesus called it abundant life. So don't, so listen, just don't make your struggle your identity. Make your identity in Jesus. Oh, man, that was worth coming to church for right there. So when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom in physical Jerusalem, what will flow from that temple? There will be a river of living water that brings life to the Dead Sea. And I won't take time to turn there, but in Ezekiel 47, verse 9, it talks about it. And it also talks about it in Zechariah 14. But the, the, the river that flows out from under the temple will bring life to everything that's dead. And that will physically, literally happen. So I'm going to give you the punchline. You ready? The prophetic fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. What, of course, Jesus fulfilled it, but it's going to be fulfilled in the last days. It represents there will be an ingathering of souls, the final great ingathering, and Israel and all the nations that survived the great tribulation or Jacob's trouble will gather to worship Jesus in the new Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles when God comes to tabernacle with man. And I believe it's going to happen on the calendar during the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles from the 15th to the 22nd of Tishri during the Feast of Tabernacles. Because every other feast was fulfilled during the feast, why wouldn't this one be? So let me read one pa final passage to you today in the book of Revelation. Now, this is the last chapter of the Bible. I want you to see. I want to read the, the last one to you so you know that we win. This is chapter 22 of Revelation, verses 20, 1 through 21. I mean, it's okay to read a lot of Scripture because we're at church. All right, okay, all right, all right. Okay, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. So if you're wondering where the tree of life went, you know, the one that Adam used to eat from, but then he sinned and God ran him out of the garden because God didn't want him to eat from that tree. Not that God didn't want him to live forever. He just didn't want him to live forever separated from God. So he said, well, we got to separate from this tree until we get this figured out. Of course, God had a plan from the foundations of the earth. He knew Jesus would be the Lamb of God slain. And so here is the tree of life. It reappears and it's back on earth and it's in the new Jerusalem and out of the temple flows a river of life, and on and where, where is the, the tree? And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit in every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. How about some good tea leaves right there? And there will be listen to this, and there will be no more curse. The curse that man brought on the earth from his sin obliterated but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in the earth and his servants shall serve him ha guess what you still get to volunteer in eternity because that's something that we were created to do somebody like you don't want to get to heaven and have to go to volunteer school because you didn't do it when you were here at Harvest Church I mean, when we, get to, when we get to this place in, in history, I'm going to see all y'all be like, oh, Jesus, I can teach this class. I went to Harvest Church. I got this. All right, y'all sit down. Open your Bible. <laughs> Let me get y'all trained. So we have some great volunteers. Did you know that we have volunteers in the nursery this morning taking care of your babies? We got volunteers in preschool and in our elementary kids and in the youth right now. We have the youth having a Bible study right now. We have the worship team and the lighting crew and the cameramen and we have the sound techs and we have, we have Nana and her happy elves that decorated for Christmas yesterday that volunteered and we have people in, 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 in the coffee shop and we have people in, in, the, in, 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 in the parking lot and we got volunteers everywhere around here. It's all Awesome. We got greeters in the hallway. We got greeters in the sanctuary. We got greeters at the front door. We got greeters in the parking lot. Pebble park cars. We, what we do? We have people serving. Why? Because this is how the kingdom works. It's a kingdom of 
servants. So I just want to give a shout out to all of our volunteers. We even have, we even have greeters and, and, and volunteers hosting online right now that are hosting the people that are worshiping with us online. Did you know that all of our, we're, we're, we're beyond our pre-COVID numbers now when you count our online uh, attenders? Now, in person, we're still not back to where we were pre-COVID, but when you throw in everybody that worships online, we're beyond what we were before COVID because so many people worship online now. And that's just the way it is. I'd rather y'all be here because I want to see your face. But I'm glad you're there. You're virtually here with us. And I, I just thank, I'm thankful for the technology that we have so that they can be with us and we can be with them. And I'm so thankful for these amazing cameramen and the TV operators and the switchers and all the God, tech, techie people that know all that stuff. And I don't have a clue, but I'm glad they're here. And they're all volunteers. God bless them. So in the kingdom, it says that when the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles happens, they will be, that his servants will serve him. How many know they're already doing it? And God bless you guys for it. Yeah, one more time for all of our volunteers. <laughs> Woo! And they will see his face, verse 4. I think, I think the volunteers get to see his face first. And his name will be on their foreheads. I don't know what that's going to be like, but I think it's going to be cool. Jesus' name on our forehead. So I'm not an anti-tattoo guy, but... One day, the Bible says God's going to write his name on me, and I want him to be able to put it wherever he wants to. So I'm just keeping all this reserved in case, you know, I don't want him to go, oh, man, I was going to put it there. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he could erase some stuff if he needed to. I'm just kidding you. But, so, but his name will be on our forehead. I, what is that going to be like? There will be no night there. Woo! All of us night people who stay up late, we just get to stay up all the time. There will be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light or sun, for the Lord God gives them light. And they shall, they shall reign. We, us, they, we shall reign forever and ever. Why? Because we're reigning with him. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the, Lord, uh, and the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which must take place shortly. When's it going to take place? Shortly. Either it's going to take place soon or the apostle John was short like me, and the, and the angel was harassing him, calling him shortly. I don't know. Verse 7, Jesus said, behold, I am coming quickly. I don't know what that means to you, but that means quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then the angel said to me, don't do that. For I am your fellow servant and the servant of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. So in other words, if, you do the, if you're a doer of the word, angels are your servants. Amen. And then the angel said, worship God. Don't worship me. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, the angel told Daniel to seal those words until the end. But this book, he said, don't seal these words, for the time is at hand. Hallelujah. If it was at hand then, how many know it's much more at hand now? He who is just, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do, the com do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Hallelujah. We get what Adam wants. We get, we get to go back to the tree. How many know it's all about a tree? <laughs> it happened. It, how many know it wasn't the apple on the tree? It was the pear on the ground. <laughs> and they ate from the wrong tree, but then in a garden. And then Jesus came back, and in a garden at a tree, he got it back for us. Amen? Amen. And now here we are again at the tree of life. We get access again to the tree of life. He says, um, uh, right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. How many of those are the right way to enter? Amen. There's only one way in. You got to go through the gate. And Jesus said, I am the gate. Amen? Amen? Yes. But outside are dogs. 
What kind of dogs? Labrador retrievers. No, he's talking about people that are not ethnically Jewish or that have not accepted his ethnically Jewish son, Jesus. <laughs> so these are people that have rejected the gospel. Dogs. This is a Jewish uh, idiom or, or slang for non-Jewish people. But outside of the city are dogs and sorcerers. So these are drug dealers and people that deal in witchcraft and sorcery and that sort of thing. The word is pharmakia. It doesn't mean pharmacists aren't getting in. It just means people that use these things improperly, that, that abuse these things. And there's a difference between use and abuse. Different sermon. Sexually immoral people and murderers and idolaters. Idolaters are people who worship something above God. For some people, it's their own opinion they worship. Woo, come on. Whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. So we should be talking about these things in church. I am the root and the offspring of David. Man, there's a whole lot right there. There's a whole sermon just in that phrase. He said, I'm not only where David came from, I came from David. How do you do that? You got to be God. It's like the, the, uh, the Bishop Malachi. Have you heard about the Bishop Malachi prophecy? And from the 1400s, uh, this uh, Irish... A priest, he was filled with the Holy Ghost and he had a vision and he wrote down the, he actually walked from Ireland to Rome and he shared his vision with the Pope. And in the vision, he was given the name and the coat of arms for the next 14 popes. And the 14th Pope would be the last Pope before Jesus came. Now, that was hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And he's gotten all of them right, and we're now at the 14th one, which he got right again. And the History Channel did a documentary on this, and they said it's mathematically impossible that that could happen. To do that, to predict that with that accuracy, you would have to be a god. <laughs> well, <laughs> the History Channel just admitted there was a god. All right. So Jesus said, I am the root and the offspring of David. Oh, and by the way, did I say, did I mention we're at the 14th and final, we're at the last pope. This is the last pope because Jesus is coming. He is the head of the church, amen. You don't need a pope. <laughs> anyway, he says, I am the bright and morning star and the spirit and the bride. Say what? Come. And let him who hears say what? Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Jesus is all about that water, isn't he? For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God, will, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. And he who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming quickly. Amen. And then John said to that, even so, Come, Lord Jesus. Or we would say, Mar they would say, Maranatha, which means come, Lord, come. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And that's how the book ends, y'all. The book ends with Jesus saying, I'm coming quick. <laughs> that's exciting. So as I give the altar call this morning, or invite people to make Jesus the Lord of their life, I want to point something out that's just interesting. That in these last days, altar calls are becoming more and more of a rare commodity because there's fewer of them left. In other words, there's coming a time when there will be no more altar calls, and if you wanted to get right with God, it's too late. You, like Noah's generation, missed the boat. Now you know where that phrase came from. <laughs> they literally missed the boat. How many of there's another boat? metaphorically, and you don't want to miss it. So the altar call I'm giving to you right now is a rare jewel and gem. So if you need to respond to it, don't postpone it anymore. Would you bow your heads with me right now and close your eyes? If you're watching this online, I want to pray for you as well. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I encourage you to repent of your sinful life today and call on the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. 
If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or if you have, but you've not been living for God and you need to get right with God today, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. If you're watching this online and you say, hey, pastor, that's me. Please include me in this prayer of salvation. Would you just type down in the comments, that's me. We'll know what you're talking about. We even have online hosts there that can help you if you need help or want prayer. But just type, that's me, and I'll know that I'm including you in this prayer. If you're in the room today and you're not right with God and you want to be, and you just want, please let me know that I'm including you in this prayer. Raise your hand right now and say, that's me, Pastor. Please include me in this prayer. Awesome. God bless you. One, two, three. God bless you. Four. Anybody else want to join these? Awesome. God bless you. Five. If you raised your hand or should have raised your hand, we're going to pray right now. We're all going to pray with those four or five folks that raise their hand and those online because we want you to feel like you're a part of something because you are. You're not alone anymore. You're not joining the church or getting religion. You're being brought into the kingdom of God. Let's all pray together, everybody. Say this out loud enough to hear yourself say it. Say, dear God in heaven, I repent of my sin and I call on Jesus to save me. Fill me with your spirit. Give me this living water that I may thirst no more. Jesus, I'm yours. From this day forward, I'm all yours. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer, you got born again. There's a party going on in heaven for you. It's your birthday. You got born again. We rejoice. Hallelujah.